Hi, my name is Dorian, and this is You, Me, and the Industry. A podcast where I get to hang out with people from the games industry and talk with them about their job, the industry, and a bunch of other stuff. This episode, I am joined by Alex Neonaki, a former character concept artist at Naughty Dog. We discuss the exceptional work she did at the studio, her passion for details, the current state of the industry, and much more. Furthermore, we talk about the concept art of Elden Ring, how social media impacts our perception of art, and I get to ask about a very interesting theory about Mardo Ligarius from Bloodborne. We openly talk about story events and locations of The Last of Us Part 2, so if you don't want to get spoiled, you better first finish the game and then come back. Please enjoy. And welcome to the show. Today I'm joined by Alex Neonaki, who is a freelance concept artist and an illustrator who previously worked at Naughty Dog on games such as The Last of Us, Uncharted 4, Uncharted Lost Legacy, and The Last of Us Part 2. She's also a huge lover of horses, guachi, and a badass raid leader in World of Warcraft. Alex, welcome to the show. Hi, I love the addition of raid leader. <laughs> that is like <laughs> such a part of my life right now. Hello. Yeah, I mean, I added the bad. I added the badass, but you know, I think every every raid leader has to be sort of some sort of a badass, in my opinion, <laughs> because uh, I also have experiences with um, being on a raid uh, in World of Warcraft. Yeah. Um, but I have stopped uh, ages ago. I think I stopped with um, the add-on Cataclysm. Wow! That yeah, that one. is a while yeah. ago. But uh, yeah, but I think I, I, I think I, I, I still have enough hours um, piled up to be like an average player up until now. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I'm still like I'm still fine. I, I actually put in the hours. I put in the hours nice. a long time ago. Yeah, I actually stopped playing for a bit around Cataclysm. Oh, wow, um, wow. Just because life got really busy. It's a huge oh, yeah. time sink of a game. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just, you know, I think um, I think uh, um, back in the day I described it as like um, the, the world's best chat room because you got to hang out with all these people and like talk about like random stuff and then you just were playing on the side and I think it uh, that was kind of the way I always described World of Warcraft to me. Oh yeah, the social part is what brings me back awesome, to it because right, yeah. I've been in this yeah. guild for I don't know, like 13 years or something now. Oh wow, crazy. And so I've known these people a really long time and yeah, yeah. we all kind of like in ways grew up together some mm -hmm. of them um as well as right. like the addition of new people but we all like have gotten pretty close and i consider a lot of them my good friends so i just yeah. go there and hang out with my friends in, yeah it's crazy in the shadowlands <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know like you know sometimes it was like friends of mine like uh, we're, we all grew very close uh, we met through world of warcraft and then they moved to to um, a city here in germany and then we hang out like uh, casually and stuff so it's kind of interesting that we're like, sort of all bonded through this one game and now we have like this strong uh, yeah circle of friendship uh, all related to world of warcraft kind of crazy <laughs> yeah it is it's like weird to think back on it that like wow some of you like i've met some of them in person yeah some mm -hmm. that live like in in the area uh, and it's like yeah, i met you through world of warcraft i've known you this yeah. long through world of warcraft yeah, yeah yeah and i think there's those are also like real memories like you know like yeah. raiding and like you know grinding all these like uh, bosses um I don't know, like, the, the only thing I remember is, you know, like, still going to Nax and uh, Nax 40 <laughs> back in the day. Okay, yeah. <laughs> like, tons of people, you know, like, uh, that was crazy. What a, what a wild time. <laughs> yeah, no, it always felt so good after, like, I mean, it still does when you make multiple attempts at something as a group and then right. finally, like, clicks in a place and you get it. Like, right. it just is such a good, such a great feeling that I've had a yeah, hard yeah. time getting in other games, honestly. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Mm. And uh, yeah, you know, like I said, um, I also also um, already teased it a bit with the badass raid leader part. And uh, yeah, for the guest topic, you thought it would be a great idea to maybe talk a little bit about World of Warcraft <laughs> and uh, also maybe about Elden Ring because, uh, well, what else is on our minds uh, besides <laughs> those two games or <laughs> most of the time or like besides Elden Ring these days? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, maybe it started with World of Warcraft. So like, yeah, like, I, I want to know more. Like what, like, like since when have you become a raid leader so for, for how long oh man so it was just last season that i mm -hmm. started doing it and it was because our previous raid leader took a break mm -hmm. he'd been doing it for a while so he's just like i just need a break so i was like okay i'll right. like there was a void for a bit and i was like i'll fill in for that and i ended up really liking it i don't know i like like doing the whole 
pre-planning stuff and like reading about how the fights are and like I used to I used to just roll in and not know anything I'd be like <laughs> all right someone tell me what to do here and I just stand in all the mechanics and everything right, uh, so it's right. kind of funny that I'm the one mm-hmm. that became uh the leader but yeah I don't know it, it's it's there I'm friends with all the people that mm-hmm. I do this with and so it's not right. it's not like me like always just bossing them around or anything like that we're very casual uh okay. we're like an a uh, heroic raid guild not mythic or anything like that oh, so okay. we just mm-hmm. go in and have a lot of fun i'm just the one okay, that like cool. pr- i am guaranteed to pre-learn the mechanics so somebody can explain it <laughs> mm-hmm. okay okay <laughs> but yeah it's uh i do that like twice a week now well no three okay. times a week i'm playing wow because i also do mythic plus i do some pvp oh, wow. like i'm just in wow <laughs> all the time uh wow and i used to feel guilty about it like i think when i was younger i felt guilty about how much i, I would spend in WoW. i was like man imagine if i like use that time for art but i've kind of realized right, yeah. as i've gotten older it's like no i was never going to use that time for art i always need yeah. downtime and that to me is my downtime like right i'm never gonna be the person that like does art 24 7 i think that's silly yeah right i think that's also like the wrong approach because but i actually i agree i also thought about this you know because like when you do like slash plate it's like mm-hmm. man it's bad just yeah. imagine just imagine me putting like half of those hours into learning like like french or something <laughs> like i could be i could be now like, now like like a like a, working at the embassy or something <laughs> but uh, like yeah i i also agree that because like yeah i mean like really were you like really putting all those hours into like french i mean come on let's be yeah, let's be serious no, i wouldn't i would have found something else because exactly, my yeah. mind needs the the break or whatever from yeah exactly learning exactly. yeah and uh, yeah i guess we can also move over to you know like elden ring so uh-huh. like yeah i guess um also a little bit uh, sort of like teasing already your job as a as a concept artist or like now as an illustrator or previously as a concept artist so like for example, like from software, are very notorious about their concept art. I guess like um, people are digging through concept art tons of times because they say like, oh, okay, like this was once a location for this, and oh, like I can get a little bit of a of a story hint on, uh, through this. So, do you can you tell from like a game like Elden Ring that there's like they have like this special relationship to concept art, or can you tell anything from that, or is it just like yeah, I guess they just have great concept artists. That's it. Um, they're very inspired by not just like current stuff but very much from older like illustration and stuff like right. i would say a lot of people have talked about the art of elden ring and i've seen some people say stuff that it, you know the graphic fidelity is not what you would see in like horizon or something like that i don't give right. a shit to me it yeah. is the most beautifully art directed game i've seen in a very long time and i think right. that some of that's off i shouldn't have said shit i'm sorry you can bleep that <laughs> you, i mean i mean you, we, we can curse on this podcast on this <laughs> okay. show, however okay. you want um, <laughs> it's like to me it's like it's so thoughtful the the art mm-hmm. styling of it all and of course so, a lot of that can be attributed to their concept art but i think that their art director and their 3d teams and like i think that they have a cohesive vision um right. that they're following and it's just so apparent when you're playing it like you get an epic vista from from every perspective and the like tree is centralized so no matter what part of the world you're in you always see this tree like kind of silhouetted against these really stark skies and it's like you can people have brought up the kind of like the lord of the rings uh influence Mm -hmm. in it and there's a couple shots in particular that are like oh man yeah that is a (laughs) hundred percent uh what they're looking at so i think that they take that stuff very seriously they take like mood very seriously and right. to me, they're one of the like top companies that do that. So like, yeah, I guess we're not seeing the detail on all the tiny little hairs or whatever, but right. the overall direction of it is so thoughtful. And to me, just it makes it so much more immersive. Like I want to I want right. to poke at stuff and I want to be in mm-hmm. the world yeah. and I miss the world when I'm not in it. I don't necessarily feel that about a lot of other mod- which is nothing yeah, like, right. I hate to. <laughs> I never like to take shots or anything like that. I'm not. I'm not mm-hmm. taking shots at those games. I think those games are brilliant. I think they are beautifully art directed. Right. Yeah. But it's just to me, this is like just he- like head and shoulders above everything else, which, right. including stuff I've worked on. Like, <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> um, I, yeah. yeah I, I just I love it. Right. 
I mean, there is something special about it. I mean, it is right now in the zeitgeist, you know, everybody's talking about it. I think um, it, it hits differently, it feels like, you know, and I think um, I saw on Twitter, I'm not sure, maybe even you wrote it, um, that they're like... Um, that they are more uh, not reluctant, they're more daring to 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 sh to hide some things that you don't really can't really make out what those creatures really look like yep. because and they either move weirdly or they are more like opaque in the shadows or something. And it kind of um, like uh, maybe it was you you said like I I think, <laughs> um, yeah like most of the other studios would be like yeah we have to light it better so we can like everyone can see like the gruesomeness or like the the weirdness of the monster. But they just say like hey, you know like. Um, it's it's good the way it is. I think yesterday I fought this like very strange boss on like is this horse or something, and I'm just like, like what is even like what am I even fighting? It looks like a giant person on like a, a horse. I'm not quite sure what I'm even looking at. So it's like it's kind of weird, but it feels like this like fever dream of a game. You're just like wow, it's like it's it's it felt very weird. Like like. Also co cohesive, but still very weird in like a fever dreamish way. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's what they nail. I think there's their the boldness of it, will, the willingness to spend all this time detailing these characters and these creatures, and then to put them in in darkness or fog or or like right. make it so that you're you, like the way that they move, you can't really parse it, but the way it moves is so frightening to some like like part of your brain <laughs> that right. it allows you to see enough of it to be like i'm afraid of that and then you fill in all the gaps like so right. to me that's the most e effective like form of i guess horror because i, I would kind of mm -hmm. classify some of this as horror like the hands are right. <laughs> terrifying but yeah they they always do that i feel like they always do a good job of that you can never quite parse what you're looking at and i think it kind of lends itself well to their design format where like they ex expect you to die over and over again and have right. to go back and see these things over and over again right. and that may be like at you know part of the interest of it is you start to see more of it by looking at it over and over again mm -hmm. so i find the whole thing very interesting from like an, an art perspective that like yeah a lot of other modern games the lighting is like they just the character lighting not the environment lighting but the character lighting right is done in such a way that you can they, like they don't even have shadows on their face half right, the time yeah, exactly. because you're just there they just want you to see all those details because yeah they put millions of dollars into those details so they're like right, yeah. yeah let's get right up in there and see all the teeth and hair and all that stuff that we spent money putting tech into like that's always the vibe right. I, I get from it and they do the exact opposite of that with elton ring which yeah uh, i really love it i love the end result right yeah and can you can you tell like based on like your experience that they have like this sort of like special relationship to concept art or is it just basically not noticeable for you or like is it just like a great game um it's i mean i, I would have to i haven't honestly looked at a ton of the concept from this game but in looking at right. the concept from like bloodborne or the mm -hmm. dark souls games 100 percent. like they do the concept and then they mostly match that like it's mm -hmm. very right, yeah. and i don't know their process like it's it's very hard without being mm -hmm in a company, there are some companies that they adjust the concepts after the fact to create marketing images out of them. So I actually don't right, know yeah. if like, was that mm -hmm. actually the concept you use? Like, I don't know their pipeline not being there. So right. it's hard mm -hmm. for me to say. It seems like, yes, they're very conceptually driven just mm -hmm. based off of the type of creatures that they design and like how yeah, right. conceptually strong everything is, but it's mm -hmm. it, that right. could be a number of things. Like, and it, it's hard to like pin that on concept um, particularly because it's probably right. like any company everybody kind of working together uh on that sure yeah i mean of course yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah but you know like even to me like i think concept artists always been sort of rather hard to grasp in my mind because i guess like every studio handles it a, bit, a little bit differently and also i think from your previous talks you explained that like yeah some of the stuff you did at naughty dog could be very different than other studios so like but maybe like like you could explain it in your words, like to you, like what does concept artist art do, and um, like how how like how would you define the impact it has on the overall production of a video game? Yeah, I mean, like you said, it's different everywhere. At least at Naughty Dog, it was, you know, it takes a lot of time and money to do a final character or a final environment, and the amount of people that go into creating what you see at the end is astronomical. Right. Mm -hmm. Characters would be worked on, main characters were worked on from the beginning of production to the end. So like mm -hmm. years worth of time. So a painting can take like what, like a couple days or a week. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so our job was to kind of 
first of all, help provide narrative ideas, like the, the pre-production stuff. It's just like, okay, let's figure out who these people are and right. what type of clothes they'd wear and like how that's going to, you know, move through the story. Like, so it's just like a kind of top level, like who are they? Mm-hmm. What are they like? And then once we're into production, it's just faster for us to like provide notes as a paint over or to provide, right. it's, it's also a more efficient way of communicating with, an, with mm-hmm. the rest of a visual team. And the most important thing is it's the easiest way to communicate to the directors and be like, right. here's what we're thinking of doing with this. And then they don't have to have the 3D team spend days doing something that's going to take us hours Mm -hmm. they can look at it and be like okay yeah we like this and then hand it off to 3d because the the 3d teams tend to be the most bogged down like they're the ones that actually have to like carry out the task of doing the stuff so the Mm -hmm. more stuff that you can the the least amount of changes (laughs) that you're throwing to them the better and it's not it's not how it always works out like there's still going to be changes when stuff goes in um but Mm -hmm it's an attempt to alleviate some of that upfront is, is how we ended up helping out towards the end. In the beginning, it is just, you know, like I said, what you think of when you think of concept art, which is designing stuff. And, Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's a, it's an entire, at least at Naughty Dog, it's an entire pipeline involvement. Like we're in it till the end. And in the Mm -hmm. very end, we were even helping character like I would make, I made, I think almost all, if not all of the plaid textures in, in the game I made. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Because yeah, they were busy. The character team is super busy. So anything that they, that we could help them with, we would help them with. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's, uh, it's just a, it's support and helping to visualize the end result in the mm-hmm. fastest and most efficient way possible. Yeah, sure. Uh-huh. I think to me also, um, based on the research I did, uh, the concept artists are always like so knowledgeable in so many different areas because like, well, they need to be knowledgeable, I guess, you know, sometimes when it comes to horses or sometimes it's like what people are wearing, like fashion sense. So like, like, and uh, I guess this is something that you loved about um, doing all this research on, on certain things, but like, like how can people really sort of like, sort of, sort of like knowledgeable enough for all these things? Like, like where does fabric tear? Like, how does a horse move? Like, all these things are like, you know, like, sometimes these are like, like other jobs. Like, you know, like a biologist, for example, would rather <laughs> notice. Or like, you know, somebody who, who who is like, you know, like a horse whisperer or something. You know, like, these are like real people who have real jobs. And, uh, and um, like, you sort of have to get like a good grasp about it. So like, yeah, like, it's kind of, to me, it feels like very daunting. So like, how, how do you, how do you handle all these like difficult things? Uh, it's needs based, right? And also like, tasks get assigned at at least at night dog based on personal interests and personal skills so like young nam was the concept artist who's there the longest for character he's still there actually and he's the guy who designed the original ellie and joel for the last of us um he is amazing at creature stuff at specifically the clickers Mm -hmm. like and the infected so almost all of the infected stuff was done by him and so he Mm -hmm. had this like crazy vast knowledge of like Okay. how stuff would grow and all, the, but, like, all that stuff. stuff yeah yeah and that's <laughs> yeah. that was a learned thing he didn't come in knowing that stuff it's not like he had to like preload and like know all right. I-, I might need to know this one day um yeah, right. he just over time because he spent so long like with mm-hmm. this type of character he learned it like he just would research it himself and same with me and horses like i ridden horses since I was a kid and I've been obsessed Mm -hmm. with horses since I was a kid so I just knew about horses so when it came time for horse stuff it'd be like oh Alex is a horse girl so we're gonna ask her about it uh then when it was like additional stuff that you don't necessarily know uh, for me it's a big part of the job to do research you already mentioned it Mm -hmm. I would say most of my time is spent doing research when I'm doing like a single Mm -hmm. concept like I spend days looking for reference trying to figure out what I'm trying to do, reading about right. it. And that to me is my favorite part. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. So I think that just, uh, you don't have to go in knowing all that stuff. Nobody would. It's a crazy uh, event. Yeah, the, the thing you said about yeah, yeah. Um, materials ripping, we learned that by literally like experimenting. Like we mm-hmm. stood in the room and ripped up material and we're like, yeah. oh, okay, it's ripping here. Like, oh yeah, I like this shape mm-hmm. that it makes. So just being willing, understanding that like the job is not just, sitting there painting stuff it's like okay you have to like go learn stuff <laughs> based mm-hmm. on the the job at hand um that varies based on the, the project or or what it is you're currently working on right yeah 
but also like most good play, most good directors, art directors are going to lean into the things that you're already pretty good at. Like they're not going to throw like no director has ever thrown mech stuff at me because they're like, there is no way she's interested right. in that. And it's like, I'm not, I don't know the first thing about how that stuff works. Right, um, yeah. Uh-huh. So yeah, they, they know that like, okay, animals, horses, stuff like that. Let's throw that at her. So yeah, it's like, it's kind of a, a give and take, I think. Right. Yeah. And I think uh, on a different podcast, I think, or in a different interview you said like one of your pet peeves is like, um, seeing like tears and holes in fabric where it doesn't make any sense. So it's like, like it usually should be like on places where there's a lot of like ripping or like where people are touching, you know, for example, in the last of us, there's like an apocalypse happened. So like people were fighting and like, like, you know, uh, running through the rain or stuff. Yeah. Like there has to be a sort of wear to the clothes. So, but like, do you really think like, um, people actually notice like do, or do you think it is something like once it is not there people so your brain will sort of notice that it does, something is kind of off that it doesn't make sense but you don't really expect like people to just go like oh yeah that's great that they put the tear actually where it makes sense or something <laughs> yeah it's a really good question i think almost all of the stuff that i pay the most attention to is either fully missed or very subconscious for people right but all those details added together when you really you know spend a lot of time paying attention to it all of that stuff does do something it does amount to something Mm -hmm. and i remember bringing up that you've done so much research you you seem to have listened to so many of the podcasts i've done (laughs) i'm so flattered by that Um, but uh the uh the one that i talked about the the holes being annoyed by it the example i gave was the second season of um what was that show called stranger things Mm-hmm, okay. remember like the kind of punk crew that showed up they had their the way that their clothes were ripped didn't make any that looked like they did it on okay. purpose <laughs> yeah and i wasn't the only one to notice it so it is like other people were like there's something right. about them that i don't like their costumes and it's like it's a couple things i think a lot of their clothes looks new with just like right. random holes punched in it mm-hmm. and so i think people do recognize it they might not have the words for it but they can right, look yeah. at it and be like, there's something about this I don't like. Yeah, something is off, right? Yeah, yeah. and they usually say it like that, that they don't like it. And so mm-hmm. then you have to kind of dig a little deeper and be like, well, what is it that is bothering you about it? And then usually they'll kind of be like, okay, I don't like this, this, and this. But it's a it's a subconscious thing, I think, that people right. have. And it's the same thing with like, when you're running around an environment, if you're seeing the same pieces over and over and over again in every environment you go to, you eventually start right. to latch on to it. You're like, I've seen this thing before. And it creates this weird, like, I call it the Escher yeah, yeah, right. effect. Like you yeah, feel like right. you're in an Escher painting. So it's like, I think I've right. been here before. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's like stuff like that. That's like, it's not overt, but it does impact your experience while you're playing it. And so tr- get doing all this work and like kind of doing this stuff is a way to just sort of help the player suspend disbelief so that they feel like they're right. in a real space with mm-hmm. real people experiencing something real like that's right. that's the intention behind it and mm-hmm. how it, successful that is is hard to quantify but i do think that we pull it off for the most part yeah i mean that's uh, always always one of those things where i was like speechless when i played like the last of us and last of us part two which is like just the sheer amount of like content in the sense of like like I, i'm always like it sounds very strange but i think i'm always always the most impressed or, like one of the things i was most impressed by was the 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 amount of empty rooms in the game that are just there to tell like like a set design but they are they are not they're not having like a real purpose in the sense of like oh yeah there's like some ammunition there there's just like a room that said has been lived in and i think i think it adds so much to the story and to the characters and i think it goes also to show like all the work you put in or through like you know the fabric what you just mentioned and i think um yeah what i maybe to elaborate on what you just said I think it's so interesting when I did the research for you on like seeing like all the stuff you worked on, for example, like the belt buckle on on Tommy uh, for Tommy or mm-hmm. um, yeah, the stuff in Ali's room that you you like you said like most of the people will never notice. Like, but like, do you sometimes feel like um, you lose sort of a motivation when you feel like? Well, I mean, I'm working now on this sort of belt buckle on like this minor, like not minor, but I mean like side character of the story. And uh, I'm pretty sure nobody will like take the time to sort of like check out his belt buckle. Uh, buckle, And, you know, like, is there something, is there something like a sort of motivational like um, restraint where you say, like, you know, like, what am I even doing? Like, I it, it might even be cut in the end or nobody will notice. So like, why am I putting all this effort in? No, because I think I'm like broken in my brain, honestly. Like <laughs> I am the type of person who feels when I find something in a game, 
that I right. think maybe no one else has noticed. It feels so special. Right. It feels like, mm-hmm. oh, wow, like, look at this thing that I discovered. And I love that. Right. I love a sense of discovery in games, which is probably why I love Elden Ring so much, honestly. But <laughs> yeah, um, right. it's like, I love mm-hmm. to find those little vignettes or those little moments. And I know going into it that not everyone's going to find it. But the people that right. do find it, I want them to have that sense of discovery and that sense of like, mm-hmm. oh, wow, look at this little detail. And I think that's also how the positive side of gaming communities get formed, like around, right. like, because there's so much negative <laughs> in that. Mm-hmm. But the positive parts are people sharing those experiences and kind of right. discussing and, and kind of comparing each other's experiences against their own. And I think that makes the world feel so much bigger than it is. Like it's that right. illusion of scale mm-hmm. that that helps yeah, right. build. And that to me is what I love in games. So right. yeah, exactly. that's yeah. the stuff I want to work on. <laughs> like I actually yeah, yeah. find it's the opposite when it's like really like the the, the kind of like big key moments i'm like oh, right. i don't know about that and i'm kind of like that and like even when i go to paint stuff like we'll go to nice locations to plain air paintings it'll be like this big waterfall and i'm like that's overwhelming i'm gonna paint this right. tree <laughs> this little waterfall <laughs> over here mm-hmm. that i really like uh so i think that's just how i am but i could definitely definitely see people getting burnt out on doing because right. I mean I spent months on some of this mm-hmm. stuff and you know the percentage probably the the one that I had spent almost the most amount of time on that, that I think not as many people saw was in left behind I did an entire Twitter campaign for like 10 different Twitter accounts that I made up like in real Twitter <laughs> and I like oh wow really there was Weston's pharmacy had like a, a single uh, texture in it that had mm-hmm. a Twitter handle. And if, if people went online and went to the Twitter handle, they would find an entire sub story that I like I love it. managed and wrote for like, my, like I pre, I pre tweeted them like to schedule them so that they would come out uh, in September of uh, 2013, which is when our outbreak happened. So it was Damn. like incredible. I like got so, so into that. I had like this big spreadsheet of like all my stuff. And I, this, wow. this all got reviewed, obviously. Like uh, Neil, and, Neil and Bruce were like, okay, you're crazy. Go ahead. But it was so fun to me to do that. And like the, when you see like a couple people that, well, it's not a couple, people did find it. Right. And it was always really exciting to me to see the people that did, but not everybody that played the game did, obviously. Of course, like, yeah. Of course, yeah. But that stuff to me was so, so fun to be like, oh, I helped make this little Easter egg. Basically, I love Easter eggs. Right, yeah. But yeah, but I think also, I think um, the, the, the th- things you just said uh, reminded me of something Neil Druckmann said also, I think about the, um, what was it called? The um, the Take On Me cover, I think. And uh, and I think there were the discussions of like making it mandatory, like not, not missable. But I think this is like something that players actually could miss. And then I think he said something in the lines of like, yeah, I mean, like people will see this through one way or another. Like, I mean, people will through, see it either through YouTube or they will like, hear about it from friends, but or they will just do the side quest. So like, I mean, people will notice this thing. And I think um, he also talked about the importance of things being missable, but creating something special if you find it. And I think it goes like, yeah, it's just the same thing you just mentioned. Um, like putting in the, like, the effort of making something special by like caring enough to do like I guess this like <laughs> long Twitter thread <laughs> timed and especially it just shows and it's also very strange to me that um you know there was like the sort of um I don't want to start off too negatively with the interview but I mean like there was this whole talk about like certain story points in the in the Last of Us Part Two where they're like like nobody clearly thought about this like the character clearly the, the characters clearly would never behave this way and I'm just like like they're so detailed like they think about everything like I think they they even rendered every joint you can find in the in the in the game it differently like everything is so meticulously crafted and I, I'm pretty sure that they double and triple and quadruple check the main story for sure yep. and not like uh like people was like you know like people on twitter but like i could, I could have written it way, way better you know yeah <laughs> no like, i promise they couldn't <laughs> yeah i'm just like yeah and it was always also so funny because like um yeah like, uh, yeah i don't know it, it, it it's just so weird to me because like all the people like it shows so much that all the all the things and you, i think just this interview right now shows that how 
I mean, in a good way, crazy you all are like putting <laughs> in all these like details, you know, like, and uh, like maybe to, to build up on that, I wanted to know like, like how crazy, like, I mean, you all already explained it a bit, but like how crazy do you really get? Like, for example, you love doing like all these like companies, uh, the company logos you can, f you find in The Last of Us or also the stuff you did with Ellie's room. Like, like how far, like how deep does it get? Like, do you think about like, well, like this company was founded by like two sisters in like, you know, in Milwaukee and then like they grew up with a Kickstarter and then, you know, like how far does it go? Like, do you just say like, oh, this is a cool logo or, or are there like real backstories to like the logos or stuff? Um, So I don't know how, like the, the one thing that I will say about the logos, like I'd say the depth of it is there's two malls um, in Left Behind. One of them is like an older mall in a slightly more like suburban area. And the other right. one is like a city mall, like a brand new sparkly uh, mall. And there was a lot of thought put into the differences in the stores and the signage and stuff like that, right. that you would see mm -hmm. in there. And so there is in the Colorado mall, there's like, I think it's Colorado. Um, there is that the kind of the smaller sort of uh, suburban one there's more right. mom and pop style stuff. So there's more, right, yeah, um, yeah. these are, you know, family owned businesses, mm -hmm. they're local. Um, and so the, the differences in like the signage were apparent. So they would right. use like fonts more like, you know, comic mm -hmm. sans and stuff like that. Um, which <laughs> yeah. that one's always a funny one. Cause it's like, when you're doing that stuff, it's really important to not just go with what you like. It has to right, be yeah, like, yeah, you, yeah. you have to make it feel real. So you have to be like, yeah. okay, yeah, these people would use comic sans on a sign because right. people do that yeah. or papyrus or whatever. I, yeah. Yeah, right, I, yeah. I don't hate fonts the way that leading <laughs> cowboy. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and then there was something we recently <laughs> talked about in different episodes. <laughs> then um, the, the other one was much more polished. It was big box stores, brands that you would see like in, in a big chain mall. Right. With some of the smaller stuff interspersed, but we that was a very conscious effort to be like this is mm -hmm. the the more mom and pop one, and this is the the more like upscale version of it. Mm -hmm. um, right. That's probably the extent to how far we got with that. There's obviously like there's stores that she goes into that were very specifically designed to be a type of store. So she goes into right, yeah. a doll store basically. That's kind of like mm -hmm. an American Girl doll store, which is important because she's a a young girl going into a store that. She'd be slightly too old for it at that point, but she would right, have yeah. gone into a store like that, presumably as a kid at some point. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there, there also the photo booth that she does with uh, right. Riley. Yeah. Like that was all, you know, kind of trying to evoke feelings of that mm -hmm. era and teen girl stuff. So it's like right. all that stuff was very, very uh, thought out, right, yeah. but, but mm -hmm. it didn't go so deep as like, it only goes as deep as it has to to sell it like yeah, we sure. don't go so deep it's just we don't have the time to go to that oh, part of course yeah. i would do it though <laughs> given, <laughs> given the tell. choice i would do it because yeah. i did it like the <laughs> there's so many things i talk about the museum every time i have one of these things because i just it's my favorite right. thing i've ever done and yeah, right. mm -hmm. i just love it so much and i'm so proud of it but yeah like i did whole sheets of every bird type in wyoming and like laid out like where they'd be in one of those dioramas and that's just because i want to do that i want to design a like museum right. layout of birds mm -hmm. or something but so yeah if given my way i'd probably go ahead and come up with backstories <laughs> for all of them and try to inject it yeah but no it, it only goes as far as, as it has to right yeah i will say there's so many things that like i knew people wouldn't see because it's just texture wise they can't like i did <laughs> in, in left behind i did like medicine bottles and boxes and mm -hmm. stuff for the pharmacy and i did like right. fake versions of tylenol and naproxen and stuff right, and they yeah. had like the <laughs> they had the information on the side <laughs> wow. just like it was fake it wasn't real or anything but of it course. had like those like you know like recommended dosage and stuff like that wow crazy uh, but there's no like the textures are way too small for okay. to <laughs> but it's on there, it's I, mean, there. You know that. I know it's there so <laughs> yeah um you know but like maybe like talking about like this like sort of um like like once once the game is now like it gets announced and stuff like like for example like when you talk about with that stuff with neil so you worked on like the museum and i guess the aquarium in um, part two so like like when you get like the brief like what does it say does it just say they go to this aquarium or like they go to this museum and you just 
go nuts with it or are there like really like particular things they're like okay it has to have like at least like this dinosaur skeleton or like like how like how detailed are the uh, are the information you get from um, the directors by the time i got to those there the story was worked out so we knew the beats and oh. i knew yeah. also that um the museum and the aquarium are story centric so they're not if there is um fighting like combat it's not the prevalent thing the main thing of those areas is narrative and right. so i knew the major story beats i knew what the vibe was supposed to be like mm -hmm. i knew all that stuff going in it wasn't like just a oh design a museum and then they fit it in like everything right, yeah. is the it goes the other way it's like we know mm -hmm. what this is let's build everything around it right and the museum in particular was a very special place because that's where in my mind that's where the user gets to spend the time with Joel and Ellie that they've wanted right yeah what they're missing probably from the mm -hmm. first game yeah right and so i wanted to fill well we wanted to fill that space with detail to slow them down so that they could really yeah, right. take their time and like mm -hmm. feel that they had a reason to take their time right. so yeah that's all predetermined like and so everything is kind of built around that idea mm -hmm. how much does feedback loop into that so for example like do you have like sort of like time like time set times that they are like okay the character can like the player can only spend 20 minutes here or like it, it has to be like okay like you can't have too many interactables in there like are there really like rules for like designing this whole area where you're like okay you can't make it too big or you can't make it too small or it has to have a certain vibe to this um no we don't we, we kind of do it the opposite way of that again where it's like mm -hmm. we'll put the stuff in and then play test it and just see like okay. it, are people going through too fast was kind of the concern mm -hmm. with that one like okay. so we we didn't want people to go too quickly but also like I personally hate it when a game forces me to <laughs> right, yeah. like if I'm not interested in it I'm not interested in it and like exactly the yeah. main story beats are in cutscenes. so like the the rest right. of it is just additional based just icing for those who want it right. which is really important for for me personally it's like I don't mm -hmm. If, if you force someone to do it, they're not going to like it. Like <laughs> it's, right. it's there for the people that want it. And so we did test like how, how long are people spending in it? And like the layout, like the actual like layout of the space makes it so mm -hmm. you kind of have to walk, at least walk past a lot of it right. um, to get to where yeah, you yeah. have to go. And so, yeah, we just sort of looked at like how, the average of like how long people were, were spending there in the play test. And they, mm -hmm. they were spending like, you know, a chunk of time there, but there was never like a, oh, we only want them to spend this much time. There's like, you can right. take as much time as you want in the museum. We will, I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we will provide you with a bunch of stuff you can do in there if right, you feel yeah. like mm -hmm. it. And then when you're ready, you go up into the space section and then move forward into yeah. a combat scenario. But yeah, there was no like, oh, we don't want them spending too much time here. It's like, nah, it, if we can provide them with enough interest to stick around, that's ideal for the people that want to like build out that story moment a little bit. Um, but you'll right. still get the story if you just plow through it. There's nothing you're yeah, going right. to miss that's like super crucial if you just run through the museum. <laughs> yeah, right. I think there's also some, like there's this one theory I have in my head, but I can never really put it into words or like conform it, confirm it because it. I always feel like sort of the big showcase moments for video games are, I guess, what sells the game. But I think the moments that stand out for me are always the smaller, more intimate moments. So like it's like the museum, for example. And I think like those, I think those, I think to me, like the small moments make the game because I think like they feel more, I guess, special in a sort of way. Because like I, I sometimes feel like with the big chase scene, scene in Uncharted 4, I love that scene. But um, I mean, it's it's so like, I guess, like this is the, this is like where all the money goes in. Like this is like the big showpiece. Mm hmm set piece but i think like all these like little details you feel like more like personal in a sort of way yeah they feel more intimate i agree with you 100 yeah, percent. Right, yeah. like my favorite my personal favorite moment in the last of us one is it comes after the david scenario with ellie mm -hmm. and it's right before the giraffes joel asks her to do the the lift up right, thing that yeah. he does with her and so you press the triangle button and she refuses to right. do it and it's the first time she right. refuses to do it uh in the game yeah, right. and it was so special to me it was like oh like because i'm interacting with the game like as a game i'm not just watching a cutscene. Right, and like yeah, exactly. it showed so plainly that like oh she's she's really hurt like affected by this thing right, that yeah. happened to her and so then it it going into what is considered the key moment of that entire game which is the giraffe right. like 
to me the the really special part was kind of the part that came right before it like yeah where right, exactly. the game like in playing the game you get to see her um how impacted she was by it i loved yeah. that moment yeah and so it's funny that like to me the standout is the thing directly before <laughs> right yeah exactly that, that everybody yeah, yeah. considers like the key moment of that of that game exactly yeah so yeah i agree with you i think that everybody's like obviously with games like this everyone's going to have a different takeaway and everyone's going right. to pull different things that are special to them and i think what we tried to do and for the most part in all of our games i think that naughty dog is successful with it is to provide both of those like you have the big set right. pieces you have the big like you know standout moments that are the picture and all of the <laughs> right, reviews yeah, exactly. and everything and then you have like the, the kind of quiet soft moments and i think it's kind of appeals to maybe a, a two different types of gamer at least right yeah i, I also think like i also love that um, i think this is also from the last of us one um, where it's like it's sort of codes the entire moment before in a totally different light so for example there was this one moment where they get um not quite sure where they go but i think they go to get, get trapped by these sort of like uh, survivors um you know like they, they they think they push a car and then they, get, they crash the car and you have like all this like big shootouts and you have to kill a bunch of people but i think like the conversation right after that is like when ellie mm -hmm. asked joe like um like how did you know it was a trap and he just and he just says like well you know i have been on both sides like um, many times mm -hmm. and it's kind of like wow i'm just like oh wow there's like so much like i think this like one sentence like puts like so much perspective into like the whole relationship of them and also like what we just experienced because like i was like oh yeah he's just smart like i mean he's just like a survivor and, and, and i noticed that this must be a trap but like just i would never expect that he's like i guess i already like he already did it countless of times to also innocent people to be like this like quick quick of a thinker to see like okay mm -hmm. like, this is a trap and i've been already there a couple of times so i think i always like love these moments where they are like and i still remember this moment so vividly like i guess they're more <laughs> more like as like you said more like more uh, set pieces like more cinematic moments but i think like this one moment really stuck out uh, for me at least yeah and when joel talks about his past like he right. makes a point of talking about how he's been the bad guy like he's he's not this, yeah like, right purely good person which did kind of yeah, right. when people were so up in arms about about him yeah, right, yeah. dying in the second one i was like god he's like he says himself all the time that he's kind of a bad person right like, yeah <laughs> yeah but yeah i mean he had it coming like i mean he was like i mean there were so many people like even in the first game i'm just like are people like did they, people really forget like what happened in the first game i mean there were like a bunch of people who were like mm -hmm. not innocent but i mean nobody's innocent in this world anymore but i mean they were clearly like not really just like looking out for themselves and not really deserving to get like a pipe in their on their head or something and uh yeah in the second game like, oh, he, was, he was a saint he was he was such a nice man <laughs> i'm just like whoa, whoa, wait yeah did you play the same game i'm, just, I'm so confused <laughs> yeah he's like he's just a good dad it's like oh, yeah yeah okay. he was he was he was a saint and he was uh, it always it always reminds me of, of the sopranos have you seen the sopranos yeah but i haven't finished it yet i know what oh, okay. happens but yes i love yeah. yes no, I love but, it. <laughs> no but i mean the, the the mom she was always like the mother grandmother yes, yes. <laughs> she was always like that he was a saint he was like he's a nice man and he was like he was running the mob delusional <laughs> yeah and she's yeah, right. like the real villain of that entire yeah, right. series so, anyway it's so, so horrible <laughs> she's like the worst person and he's always like defending her old uh, her, yeah. her ex-husband or something it's like it, it always reminded me of that he's like and literally in therapy it. because of her yeah, exactly <laughs> and like he's all this like he's all this all this trauma by like from his father and from his like mom and stuff yeah. and she repeats just like he was he was a saint you don't know him <laughs> I'm just like whoa yeah. that's all that's all all i hear when i see the comments there yeah she's a disaster. and um <laughs> yeah totally yeah and you know like um yeah we already talked about in a previous episode about like you know people wanting to join the industry but you actually purposefully decided to leave the games industry altogether mm -hmm. um yeah so first off like how is it going like how, how has it been since going freelance um it's got ups and downs you know like uh, there is a, a comfort to having full-time work and sure. not having to chase payment not having to figure out what my work situation is going to look like next month right. i'm finally like starting to find a balance but i don't know if freelance is going to be my like end thing at this point it's like oh i don't right. it's, it's you know at this point i'm kind of just like i'll see where life takes me <laughs> okay sure mm -hmm. but um yeah i just needed a break i think like the projects are long and difficult and crunch is definitely a right. thing and i think that 
we're watching now is like the whole industry is sort of coming to a reckoning. Like people mm-hmm. are really not taking bullshit anymore. Right. It's been really, really awe inspiring to watch, especially like the Blizzard Activision people. Right. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. kind of like stand up and be like, no, I'm not putting up with this anymore. It's bullshit. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, and seeing all the the people unionizing or attempting their unionization efforts is, has been mm-hmm. like really awesome. So I have yeah. only positive feelings about where games are going. Mm-hmm. Like it's going to take a while. And I think there's going to be a lot more <laughs> probably is going to come out in the next few years as we've, we've been seeing it like, you know, monthly at this point. Right. But I think for me, I was just like, I'd been in games for so long and I just needed a mm-hmm. break. Like I wasn't, sure, yeah. you know, it, it's like, yeah, I don't. I just didn't want to be like super jaded and mm. shitty. <laughs> like, right. I wanted yeah. to take some. Time. I mean, there's a sort of passion that has to be there, right? I mean, yep. you need to be like, like you said, like this. You put so much effort and so much, um, yeah, of your of yourself in these creations that uh, that that it has to be like the right state of mind. And if you don't, if you're not feeling it, then I guess it it feels like more for like uh like stress uh than mm. than it should be i guess yeah and i think coming to the realization that like i probably put too much of myself into it <laughs> yeah. and it mm-hmm. is at the end of the day not mine like i contributed right, yeah. to it and i'll always be a part of it mm-hmm. but there's a difference between like working on a company like sony's huge so working on a sony right. product versus working on your own content is like that's a completely sure, yeah. different thing but it's easy to allow that to become your primary passion because you're putting so much right. of your time into it and you do care very deeply about mm-hmm. it right but there's a danger inherent in that because you always i've said this a few times now but you always have to compromise when it's a project that big like it's never mm-hmm. going to just be you know what what you think or what you want it to be your your personal vision always has to be compromised and i think that when that's your only thing it becomes, it sort of saps you of all of your energy very quickly. Right. And it's hard for it not to be your only thing when the hours are the way they are in games. Like when the expectation is that high and when, you know, crunch is a thing, it, it's kind of hard for it to not be your primary thing. Mm-hmm. So that's how, for me personally, that's how it became such a path for burnout. And like right. how I like, mm-hmm. it's not that I lost my passion for I miss all the stuff that we just talked about. I miss that so much with working mm-hmm. on games like that. To me, right. like people will hire me to do concept art, and it'll just be like, you know, design a character turnaround, and it's like, mm-hmm. oh, let me know what the story is, so I can like <laughs> make you some cool world building items <laughs> as well. Right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so I, I do miss that aspect mm-hmm. of it. Sure. I didn't lose the passion for it. I was just worried about how burnt out I was getting all the time. Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I got to take care of yourself. Yeah, uh, speaking of crunch, I think, um, yeah, Naughty Dog has been like sort of very infamous with their stance on crunch. And I think throughout interviews and uh, I guess also making offs, uh, you can see like that they sort of, I don't I don't want to say embrace crunch, but they sort of see like, I guess, I, I don't know, it's hard, hard for me to put it into words, but I think like they sort of have like a very different stance on crunch. Like, did, do you notice that there is something changing at Naughty Dog throughout the years that they are taking it rather seriously or because like, I think, um, um, I think both Neil Druckmann and uh, Bruce Draley both said it that like they can't really stop people from crunching because people are like really into all the work they do and putting all the details there. And it's also sort of like, I think somebody in the making offset, well, if you, if you have guests over, you clean right up before they come. So like right, right until they arrive. So it's the most, like it looks the best and everything. And I always understood it, but it's like, at what cost, you know, like at all the like people that are having burnouts and leaving the industry altogether. We had like a couple of um, like special episodes about uh, uh, the book by Jason Schreier, um, mm-hmm. um, Blood, Sweat and Pixels, uh, talking about all these like sort of people who are dropping out of the industry altogether or like going indie now because of all the crunch they endured. Um, I, so from what I know, because... I left like pretty much directly after Last of Us 2, but I, it seems right. like they are moving in a better direction with that stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's impossible to know until another production is done. Like right. if they're successful in their efforts, we won't know until we've right. passed another potential crunch. Like mm-hmm. so that's still up in the air. And I think that they, like every company, should be under scrutiny from everybody with this stuff because it's not sustainable that it is why people it's just, it's just facts like it is why people are burning out of the industry it is why it is extremely unhealthy and yeah that they i i believe everybody there has only the best intentions and are good mm-hmm. people 
but whether or not crunch actually does get controlled there is is yet to be seen and i feel mm-hmm. that way about every company that's promised right. to not have crunch it's like okay we'll circle back um, once we're getting closer to your like alpha deadline and we'll see like oh, yeah. did you really stop doing crunch so it's impossible to know um, i think it's going to be a lot harder for companies to weed out crunch because i remember reading some tweets about this and i, I agree with this and it's a little bit daunting but like they don't know how long games like that take to make without crunch because of the things that you already mentioned some people just stay there and they just work till like however long and like without actively forcing them out the door you can't really do that but also you can never compensate for how much time that actually took because they're working double what another person would do so like how do you when you're planning a project like that how do you how do you add that up like you can't and so they don't know like how long a project like that's going to take if people were just in their mm-hmm. seats Monday to Friday, like eight, whatever real hours are eight to five. I don't know what they are, right. <laughs> but, yeah. but uh, yeah, they, they don't know that. So I think that it's going to be messy for these next few, and it's going to take a lot longer than I think people want it mm-hmm. to, um, because it is going to take multiple project pipeline, like mul- uh, mul- uh, my goodness, multiple project timelines uh to see the impact of it actually working um because yeah they they need to get through this cycle to find out actually how much stuff Mm -hmm. takes like how much time does this take right so yeah i think that it's something that should still be pushed the the i think the main help in that Mm -hmm. is the like kind of social media push against it so like fans and gamers noticing that this is a thing listening to developers and being like hey like I'm going to hold these companies accountable because yeah, they're the end customer. And right. I do think that there's as much as social media is a pain in the ass. I think that gamers kind of noticing how devs have been treated and like taking a stance against it is a, is a pretty positive thing. And it's helped, I think mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, also devs coming yeah. together and talking about things like, again, the blizzard Activision thing was so shocking because I've never right. seen people like who are actively working in a place speak so strongly against the place they're working mm-hmm. at. Like that was so, right. I was like bowled over by that. Like the, mm-hmm. the, like um, it was amazing. The nerve of them is like so amazing to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Do you feel like uh, that COVID and like all this like remote working will sort of add something to like um, alleviating crunch from companies? Or do you think like there will be another way for sort of like where crunch finds its way? I think crunch can still find its way mm-hmm. in this um, because the one I love work from home, I want to work from home forever. But the one thing I yeah. will say is if the work-life balance becomes much more difficult and especially right. for people who don't have a dedicated space to do work versus relax. Mm-hmm. Like I know people that their desks are in their bedroom. So it's like, that is the, right. the work-life balance is out the window. The minute you wake up, you're at work. Right. Mm-hmm. And so right. I think that it provides uh, I think that in ways it allows people to just step away whenever they need to without scrutiny. Mm-hmm. Um, it allows, m- unless you have kids or something like that at your house, I think that I don't, I can't speak to that, but I know from friends that mm-hmm. adds a whole other layer of it. But for people without right, yeah. kids, you can focus sure. a little bit easier in the times that are conducive to like you working your best. Mm-hmm. But then I think there's other issues with it. Like I noticed that suddenly everybody wants to do like zoom call meetings over everything <laughs> it's right like, yeah exactly it's like yeah. yeah i don't think i need it but they think that oh because you're already at your desk working it's not going to be that disruptive to have like a zoom call right. board. it's like just email me <laughs> like yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> i've had book clients like try to do a bunch of zoom calls and i've had to put my foot down and be like no like i've done whole books right. and i've like i've never like <laughs> right. spoken on the phone with the art director right. mm-hmm. <laughs> so i think it, it has pluses and minuses and what i do think Mm -hmm. that it's going to provide which is fantastic is an option so like Mm -hmm. now there should be no excuse for if somebody you know needs to do some work from home for a stint they're set up for that um so Mm -hmm. i think that it's going to provide choice and hopefully that's going to help um kind of push things in a better direction right yeah Mm -hmm. i think also jason schreier mentioned that i think one of the like big issues is that people are having the need to move constantly like moving different like from state to state once a, a video game company gets shut down or stuff. So it's like, 
uh, all those lives being impacted by a shutdown of a studio, I guess this is also something that might be a little bit alleviated by like being able to remote from uh, work from remotely from anywhere in this in the state or like in the in the country even. Oh yeah, or, or even in the world. Like I know that I, yeah. I've had so many students reach out to me and be like, I don't think that you know I could get a work visa to go live in the U.S. And I know from experience how difficult and frustrating right. and scary it is and mm -hmm. expensive, like all this stuff to move here. So right. now this provides no real excuse for not hiring people from different countries who might not necessarily have the means to like up and move to Los Angeles, one of the most expensive right. places to live in the entire United States. So like, I think it, it kind of, in a lot of ways, opens the industry up quite a bit mm -hmm. in, in a very positive way and allows more people a foot in the door than right. everything mm -hmm. being in Los Angeles or Seattle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we were talking about a couple of people already. Um, you, um, you you also mentioned them, like you through your time at Naughty Dog. And I, we have a segment here that I usually call Lessons Learned. And uh, I wanted to ask you about like a couple of people you interacted with and maybe like you call them mentors or you had, they had an influence on you. And I wanted to ask like, what was like something that they taught you or one of the biggest things they taught you or something? And um, so we'll just name the name and you can just tell me if they if they even taught you something good or maybe, you know, even something bad about yourself, like that you noticed and changed. Uh, uh, so let's start with uh, Eitan Zena. Oh, man. Eitan is fantastic. He's a good friend of mine now. Uh, when I first started at Naughty Dog, I was very intimidated by him because he's as good as he is. Um, but he's super, right. super down to earth. He and John and Nick Shindro, who was there at the time too, like they showed me so much stuff. Like I think Aton's the first person to show me what photo bashing was, or John, mm -hmm. one of them was the first one. Because so I like went okay. over and looked at their painting that they're working on when I first started. I was like, what, what is that? How do you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, and he was like, well, let me show you. Um, so those and guys, photo bashing is when you like use piece together photos and like 3D and stuff to like create okay. a concept. Um, it's very common, mm -hmm. especially in. Um, environment concept but it's very common mm -hmm. just in concept in general okay because fast and it's efficient right but they like they were just so open and Aton was so open with with me and sharing everything he knew like he wanted to share and at the time we were still kind of in the beginning of artists sharing their process like when when I was like first starting out nobody was honest <laughs> and upfront about their process so it was like change kind of changed everything for me to have them like um sort of be so welcoming and to like just show me everything and be like yeah I'll mm -hmm. share anything right so yeah I'd say that those guys were pretty crucial in me realizing like oh I can do this and then like they were always very like um supportive anytime I would make new work would be very supportive of it and like you know give me feedback mm -hmm. and all that stuff so yeah I, I wouldn't have gotten into concept without those guys mm -hmm. okay so how about uh, Bruce Straley and Neil Druckmann <laughs> So Bruce, I worked with mostly on Last of Us. He was like my primary, like he was the kind of my main lead on Last of Us 1. Mm -hmm. And then it was Neil on Last of Us 2. Right. And both of them, I think, just gave me a ton of confidence in myself. Like when I first started doing UI for Last of Us, mm -hmm. I very quickly felt like I was going to get fired any day. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm in over my head. They don't even have documentation mm -hmm. here. And he would kind of like, <laughs> like kind of metaphorically, like take me by the shoulder and shake me and be like, you're fine. Like we hired you for a reason. <laughs> yeah. You got this, like, stop, mm -hmm. stop thinking you don't got this. So he was very, very supportive of me early on and gave me a lot of confidence in myself so that I could go into meetings and speak confidently about stuff. And just the, the gentle reminder of like, you know what you're doing. So like, right. you can talk like, you know what you're doing. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then Neil, yeah. when I, when I made the switch from UI to concept, mm -hmm. I'd say he was probably one of the most supportive. He kind of showed me that I could do stylized work and it would still be useful. Mm -hmm. And when he started coming to me to ask me for stuff, it was, it was like, you know, he saw something in my work and he felt like I could contribute something and he knew that I wanted to do it. So he would make that effort to like, kind of push me along and and give me those opportunities so right yeah i'm very grateful to both of them for mm -hmm. the time that they spent with me and for always pushing me like always right, listening yeah, to exactly, me and like yeah. pushing me in that right direction right yeah even though neil um in the end axed your uh, own painting he, axed, he did 
did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was such a good painting. <laughs> it was it was awesome, yeah. It was awesome. I think there there's so many like I think there's so many layers to it. Like I think there you always like I, I think I looked at it a couple of times. Uh, you find always something new. I think there's always something you're just like, oh man, this is like also great. I think like uh, this is my favorite. I'm like, nah, I think uh what was the dog's name again? I always love her love the dog. What is what her, was her the name? Dog's name? Alice, I think. Alice, right? yeah. Alice, Alice, right? Yeah. So I'm just like, like a bear. Man. <laughs> yeah, just look at Alice. like Alice looks just like and I always wonder like um I, I mean you you would know probably because like I always wonder like okay, like like did he did did, did the character do all of them at once or was it like okay I did Alice and I screwed up? Maybe I can draw like persons better. Like nope. Not, 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 not the women. Maybe the man. Like, nope. Maybe it's a different man. I should draw. Nope. <laughs> like, what was like the process behind? That? Oh yeah, he worked on them slowly. I think so. Yes, right. I think that that's exactly uh, how that went down. <laughs> right, yeah. All these like, all these like now exclusive details I get for the podcast. Amazing. <laughs> And uh, yeah, last but not least, um, Ashley Sudowski. Oh my God, she's my favorite person on the earth, I think. Um, I mean, she's just the most supportive. She's my best friend. Mm -hmm. And she's the character, or she was the character art director at Naughty Dog. And she just is fantastic. The knowledge she has, how welcoming she was, how willing to share her experience and to like listen to mine and like, you know incorporate me in the entire process like she's just the ideal lead and I still learn like she's still my best friend I still talk mm -hmm. to her she's coming over on Friday I think so it's like I, I still <laughs> awesome. um you know keep in touch with her obviously and yeah mm -hmm. she I would I don't know what it would have been like for me there without her honestly like she mm -hmm. was yeah probably the single most important person that I worked with there and mm -hmm. was the reason why it was hard to leave so um yeah she's just the best yeah awesome yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah like you were speaking of art and all social media stuff so like do you think that we underestimate the impact social media has on our perception of art oh my god I don't think we can tell what it is at this point we're so embroiled in it like I do notice in myself and especially in the kind of younger generations that there's a tendency to fixate on it as like and to allow it to shape our perception of our own art like you right. see this all the time like oh if they're not getting a lot of likes or if they're not getting a lot of retweets you can easily fall into the trap of thinking like well maybe it's bad and this is not just them I've done this like I have this in my own head where mm -hmm. I'll be like oh god like should I post this thing that's a little bit different from what I normally do? What does that make it look like? Does it seem mm -hmm. unprofessional? And that's so shitty. <laughs> like, right, I yeah. think on the one hand, my social media presence has done a ton for me. It's like helped mm -hmm. clients find me. I can't sit here and deny the value of it. Like pe my work right. is hyper visible to a lot of people. Yeah, right. And it makes it so that I definitely get opportunities from it. Mm -hmm. But it comes with a pretty high cost of like mental health um, because right, you're, yeah. you're not, I don't think that we're built to hear the opinions of hundreds of thousands of people on any given day. Right. Mm -hmm. So it creates this weird, it's this, this weird back and forth. And I think the positives of it is it's pushing things to be much more inclusive. Like mm -hmm. there are way less barriers now to seeing the art of everybody, whereas when I first started, it was kind of this handful of mostly dudes, honestly, who mm -hmm. were in concept. And it was very like, kind of like, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a way to say this that isn't shitty. <laughs> it was I mean, like you a can circle. be as, as direct as possible. You know, like, <laughs> I almost said circle jerk, but that is so shitty. <laughs> it was like a circle of, of guys just kind of like, you know, recommending each other. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and say that they were they, you know, bad people. There's just the, that's right. what they had access to, like, because right. mm -hmm. everything with these tight little bubbles, they weren't like actively right, yeah. trying to hold anyone out. Some of mm -hmm. them were, but right. <laughs> most of the guys that I've known it were very sweet guys who were just like, you know, they just knew each other's work and they, they didn't really know where to find. You had to dig right. to find other people's mm -hmm. stuff. Whereas social media, Instagram, Twitter, all that stuff. Now I see new artists every day and I'm like, who are you? Mm -hmm. Where do you come right. from? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I think that that's like the primary benefit of it is it's sort of breaking down those walls pretty quickly of like, or it has mm -hmm. broken down those walls of like, 
access to different artists and different types of art. And it makes that excuse of, you know, just hiring who you know, it just, that right. doesn't fly anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'd say that's the main benefit of it. Mm-hmm. But then there's all of the like mental health issues that come along with it. And the, right. yeah, exactly. the issues of how you see yourself with compared to your art and like you know that relationship that you have with your art gets affected by it when so many other people's right. opinions feel so so kind of important and salient with it yeah right mm-hmm. so yeah it's a it's hard for me to extract myself from mm-hmm. it i try to think back to the time prior to social media but i've always been on some form of art social media i was on deviant art for years i was on mm-hmm. forums before that like i've always i guess like used those platforms to right. try to communicate and mm-hmm. uh yeah talk to other artists so it's hard for me to right. extract myself from it mm-hmm. yeah yeah and speaking of social media and the state of the games industry so do you think we are at a certain at a certain point at right now where we are mature enough or the industry is mature enough to have like intimate and like deep like character like very deep characters in video games like for example to me in the last of us part two um when sort of some people on twitter are like when the game got revealed are very focused on the size of a nose of a certain character in the game so do you think like the industry is ready for like having different kind of women or like different kind of looking women like more realistic kind of women in the game in the games when certain people are so real hung up about like I guess the, the the sort of breast size or the nakedness <laughs> of a person in the game or like the size of a nose. Like, I think it's, I, I always feel like it's so like backwards with, when I look at sometimes social media, when it comes to these things, I'm just like, wow, like this is like crazy, like how they have like these realistic characters. And then there are some people like, oh, she's a big nose. I'm just like, <laughs> I, I guess, yes, that's, there are people with big noses, right? They, these exist. You can confirm that. Exactly. So one thing that became really apparent to me actually during last, the, the release of last of us 2 being embroiled in that it feels like it's everybody it feels like oh man people hate this right. and like people are so mad and why is everyone like this and then you quickly realize so we got review bombed which i'm sure you know like oh, within yeah, sure, yeah. like mm-hmm. the minute that you could review the game on metacritic right, exactly. it got bombed by people yeah right but then very quickly as you know people that actually played the game finished it their reviews mm-hmm. spiked up to wherever they are now which is very high right. it's our it's our highest reviewed game i think right and so it was just a testament to like oh it's just a dirty little bubble of like mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of <Right>. sad <laughs> sad people and it's not everybody and it doesn't reflect even a portion of the gaming right. community as mm-hmm. a whole or of gamers and also like the the most annoying ones are always the loudest ones like <laughs> right yeah Exactly. obviously we get also the people who very much liked it i still have people like that in my mentions they'll tag me that they got a tattoo of ellie or like mm-hmm. they did fan art of ellie and I always, I always love seeing that stuff but the people that enjoyed it tend to enjoy it and then move on and do something else and the normal people who don't enjoy something don't enjoy it right. and then they move on and do right. something else but like there's this tiny exactly. subset of the gaming community that just gets and like it was bad on the last of us when you look at like the wow community versus the final it's insane and like people really? believe that like oh the game is over and nobody plays it anymore like uh-huh yeah right hundreds of thousands millions of people still play wow right. like it's yeah, just yeah. this like we these weird little bubbles that happen and people mm. within them get convinced that like oh i believe this and like i can see all these other people saying the same thing so everybody feels this way but that's hyperbolic and it's right it, in the end it's like a portion of a percentage um, and you could see that directly in the metacritic reviews so right yeah yeah it's like yeah of course the industry has been wanting things to change and your average person doesn't give a shit either way right. they're just like cool love it i mm-hmm. liked the game but yeah you, you just unfortunately in social media those loud obnoxious voices tend to get amplified because negativity seems to spread the fastest on twitter yeah right yeah which i think again is kind of a core problem of it but yeah i i i, I learned that on last of us and i was like okay got it that's right that's yeah. how it is <laughs> yeah i mean hatred and like uh, like attacking developers has been like really crazy i think with the last of us too so like do you have anything like did like were you attacked also as well because i think it got real random because like i guess like the like you know like um what is her name Ash, um, 
Actually, Birch, no, it was a different name. Actually, Laura Bailey, yeah. Laura Bailey, okay. No, Laura, Laura Bailey, yeah. She got, like, harassed by, like, a couple of really, really crazy people. And, like, did you also notice something that were, like, like how, are you, how, how are you able to create the concept art for this garbage game or, like, some, was, there, was there anything like that for you? Yeah, yeah. On anything I posted, I would get a few of those. And, like, crazy. if I said anything, the weird thing is if I said anything positive about the production, I would have, like, extreme people who were, like, no, that game crunched and therefore is evil like right. i'd have those people on my case as well so it was like like i right. got it from both sides which is oh, very wow, okay. disconcerting <laughs> yeah. it was like oh my god everybody yeah, sure. calm down um so yeah. yeah i i did and i think that i've had enough dog piling on twitter at this point to like sure, yeah. to mm -hmm. kind of know that like i don't really i try my best not to voice too controversial opinions on there anymore because okay. i just it's just not worth it right the energy sure. and like there i don't know if you've seen those tweets that are like um <laughs> hey most annoying person you've ever met like this tweet didn't apply to me specifically so i'm gonna yell at you about right. it. like stuff like that like yeah. uh, that's so true and so i just mm -hmm. i just right, like yeah. try my best to disengage from it as much as i can mm -hmm. and i do sure. feel that like good discussion on stuff like this tends to happen more in smaller communities so like discords and things sure, like that yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they tend to be the better place to have discussions like that because right. it's you know they're they're just you're not hitting a hundred like the whole world like twitter's the whole world <laughs> i don't want right. to i don't want to like y you don't really have like one-on-one -on -one conversations in a place like yeah. that yeah right mm -hmm. and yeah i think uh yeah before we close off the interview i have a couple of sort of real random questions but i always thought like Somebody needs to ask those questions. Nice. Uh, and I have to be the person who do it, does it. <laughs> so, for example, like, um, as a fan of MasterChef myself, so, yes. like, like, are you only dabbling in the US version or are you also dabbling into Canada and Australia? Okay, so there's not just Canada and Australia. There's, like, MasterChef India. There's MasterChef, really? I think there's MasterChef Germany. There's, like, MasterChef oh, really? everywhere. Uh, yeah, I think definitely. Yeah, I think so, And yeah. so I will absolutely watch all of them if they're on any of the streaming services that I have right, or if yeah. I can access them somewhere because I love it. And it's, like, the most, I find shows like that so comforting, like, Right. Sometimes when I'm done working, I just want to watch something right. mildly dramatic that it can kind of turn my brain off for. Yeah, right. Um, mm -hmm. And also they're making beautiful food. So it's like, oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. You know, I, I started with the US version and then I moved over to Canada because I was like, okay, I think in US it's too dramatized for me. It's like too much so of a, like a sitcom, yeah. not sitcom, but it's too much of like a reality show. And in Canada, they sort of try to emulate it, but they sort of try to keep it like a little bit more on like the normal side and i'm just like oh that's a better version but then i realized australia and i'm now totally in love with australia so i highly recommend that it feels like what masterchef is supposed to be just like a cooking show and like with like real positive feedback and they're all like so nice and like there's no like i don't know like feuds between them or something Amazing. Or, like, you know? yeah so um i highly recommend that and um yeah you know like speaking of also like something to, to chill out uh, like how did you handle the implosion of the bon appetit channel <laughs> that, that was a bummer uh in, in some ways but anyone that was like good from that right. like a decent person went on right. to make their own success and like sure yeah are flourishing so i think that in the end it was like good like if if content that i like is being made by shitty people i'm fine to let right. it go i'm fine and especially if the good right. people from it like get their feet under them and are able to like flourish and and do amazing yeah, right. stuff then it's like yeah see ya i don't i don't need this <laughs> i'll just watch this other thing <laughs> yeah but it felt very special it was felt something like something special but um, it did and it came out it was like uh, one day everyone was like we time. love it and then the next it was like yeah. uh-oh <laughs> yeah right so there's always like, that whiplash yeah you got that whiplash yeah, like oh no exactly. um but then in that case like i felt like the people that should rise to the top did in fact rise to the top so it was like I think in the exactly. end, a happy story. It wasn't like yeah. that all collapse and then people were kind of left out in the cold on it. Like they, right. the good exactly. people ended up in good p positions. Yeah. And I think like the last question, it has to turn, it has to tie back in with um, From Software. And I saw this on Twitter and I think, I thought nobody will ever ask this. So I have to. <laughs> and it is, what is it with your claim that um, Martyr Lagarius and the wizard from Adventure Time are the same the person. Same guy. Look at them. Like what? Like <laughs> how? They look. What the, happened here? They look the same. 
they look the really? same to me see this is this is maybe the downside of me feeling that like the way they light stuff you can't quite parse what you're looking at his shape right. to me martyr legarius's shape design okay. looks so similar to the wizard yeah. adventure time so when i saw him up on the thing the first time i was like this guy's the wizard from adventure time and then like that just got in my head and i can't really? i couldn't let it go when i make those comparisons i just like get okay. that idea in my head i'm like that's just what it is now that's my truth that <laughs> he is he is um the wizard from adventure time he's not like him i mean maybe he is like him personality wise he's kind of just a crazy old right. wizard man that lives on like appears on the roof and yeah i mean i haven't seen the concept art i mean it could very well be just like a drawing of the uh, wizard from adventure okay, time. look I mean, at the could concept art look at the shape he looks like he's got that same like the crown and he's got the beard he looks like him I would love, you know, I, I would, I would really love if, I, if, I, if the show ever gets big enough to have Miyazaki on here, which will never be. But you know, like I will ask, I will ask the question. Amazing. I will ask the question. I, I will get a translator and I will explain it to the translator in great detail that I'm not insane, <laughs> that I'm trying to do investigative journalism here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the questions that have to be asked. Did you look at the right. wizard from Adventure Time when you designed Murder right. Lucarius? Right, exactly. I hope the answer is yes, <laughs> and that I get yeah, vindicated because so people got people like, "What are you talking about?" And I was like, "Right, just yeah. look at him." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> look at him with your yeah, eyes. Alex, I mean, you know, I could have talked to you for another like two hours, but I think it would all, all blow up the entire thing. But hopefully, you will. I will get you back one day. Maybe if you return to the games industry, you're always welcome back here. Even if you're not not coming back, you know, you're always welcome here. I had a lovely time with you. And um, yeah, before we do the social media, I have one last task for you. Nice. And it is sort of courtesy here with every artist I have on the show that they sort of draw me based on what, what they think I look like. But you know, <laughs> since we started doing like all the like video stuff and everything, um, this is now a big spoiler. So I'm just look like this disappointing dude here. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to ask you, so you've got to know me a little bit for the podcast. You know how I maybe question things and how I tick, you know. And I wanted to ask you, just based on what you know about me, and I saw that you on, on Twitter that you um, drew a bunch of like sort of World of Warcraft characters based on based on, on your knowledge, like based on what they look like in your mind. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. So I wanted to challenge you. So um, we we could I, I could give you some more information if you need that, but you know, just based on me as a person, me as the interviewer. Like, what do you think my character looked like in World of Warcraft? You know, I played up until Cataclysm. I changed it throughout, but I think I played one character, um, like, um, sort of sort of in the early days of Classic, right up until Wrath of the Lich King, and then right up until Cataclysm, and then I swapped. But, like, what do you think I played? And, I mean, I can give you some little hints on, like, or, like, if you have a question about, like, the race or, like, the class or anything, and I will just uh, let you draw it very shittily i don't care how it looks like um and you know and if you would be graciously allowed to me i will post it on social media yeah um, if you think it's too terrible i won't tag you but but uh, i think uh, you know we just <laughs> talked about that not not allowing shitty things on on social media but i think um it will be fine if i post it i'm pretty sure uh, people will be nice nice and, yeah i'll do that uh, yeah if 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 you have any questions like you can ask me now um uh, if you want to know, like, you know, the race I played I, or a Horde or Alliance or something, I, I can I can answer that to make it a little bit easier for you. Well, okay, tell me if it's Horde or Alliance, but then I'm going to guess. It is, it is Alliance. Alliance. It is Alliance, right. Okay, good to know, because I was yeah, and... immediately going to do Horde, so. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. And uh, I can also give you, like, you know, the race or the class if you want. Um, um Yeah, give me those, then I can. Th okay, sure. For sure, okay, okay. I was uh, a Night Elf Rogue on Alliance. Oh man, okay. Right. I also was gonna guess human, so. Human, oh yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I swapped later on, so it's a little bit cheating. So I swapped, I think, um, right up until the end of uh, Burning Crusade. And I think with Wrath of the Lich King, I swapped to a human. So you are partially right. Um, nice. But I think the, 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 more, the more personal character to me is still the Night Elf. And, uh, oh no, I remember. I, 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 can I say that? I sold my account. <laughs> I sold my account with the Night Elf, and then I remembered. I, I mean, it, I think I think people people will. Um, I think I will. I will be released from. Um, I sold it to a friend, um, not not on a, not on an official way, of course. Nice, amazing. Uh, so, yes. so nice safe, nice safe from my side. So please, Blizzard, don't don't ban me. 
thanks so, so much, Alex, for doing it. And uh, yeah, so let's let us wrap it up. P where can people find you, and what are you currently working on that you can share or that is up upcoming? Um, yeah, uh, Beeves on Twitter. I'm Alex Nike on Instagram. Where else do I post stuff? That's kind of it. And then my, I have a personal website. It's linked off my Twitter. It's just alexneonike.com. Um, and then I'm working on a couple of different things. I have a contract with Hinterland who make the long dark. Mm -hmm. So I am, I'm like, didn't really leave games. I'm doing, <laughs> doing some work in games. Okay, okay. And I'm also working on a bunch of children's books, things that I'm very excited about. A couple of them come out soon. One of them is about, um, coral reefs, which I loved. I loved working on it. Yeah. That looked nice. Yeah. yeah. So stuff like that, various clients a couple of them are in games and most of them are children's book stuff and then i'm just yeah writing in world of warcraft and playing elden ring that's awesome yeah hopefully yeah hopefully we get more games like that that spark the creative spark um for all these future games and uh, everybody takes a lesson from elden ring and uh, maybe some raid uh, raid bosses from world of warcraft nice and yeah from my socials uh, you can find the show uh, on yumi industry Uh, on Twitter and on Instagram, and also, um, yeah, we're on Spotify and all the other, you know, like, uh, Apple Podcasts, all the other channels. And, yeah, if you like the show, you know, tell a friend, recommend me to someone, you know, leave a five-star review on whatever platform you like. And, yeah, talk to you in the next episode, and hopefully we will see a nice drawing of my potential character and what, it looked, what he looked like, or she looked like. I hope you all enjoyed the episode and talk to you, hear you soon. Take care, everyone. Bye.